Tonight we're talking about our love affair with our cars and whether given climate change and soaring petrol prices, the car as we know it has a future. Terry Tamman, and just before the break we were talking a bit about alternatives and uh, you say that peak oil may be with us sooner rather than later. How prepared are we in terms of alternatives to the car as we know it? Well, we're not. I mean, we're a resilient species and we do what we have to do. I think if you think back, for example, to World War II where suddenly various commodities were scarce, we all pitched in and we found a way to do things. But I don't think we're that prepared now, especially in business. Somebody mentioned before that higher petrol prices or scarcity of it has the biggest impact on things like food or other businesses that have to get their products to market. Many of us will find a way to get on that uh, mass transit or, or walk or bike to work or telecommute uh, if it's for our own use. But what are businesses going to do? And I don't think we're very prepared to uh, backfill that just yet. Richard Marshall, the CEO of General Motors, uh recently shocked everyone when he said the days of the petrol engine were numbered. Uh, if that's the case, what fuels do you see uh, Commodores running on in the future? Well, I think when he made that comment, he didn't actually put a time frame on it. So, you know, GM's position, I think, is pretty clear in that our strategy is that we see multiple solutions to this. There's not just one solution. Perhaps in the ultimate long term, it's generally recognised that we need to move to a hydrogen economy. And to get to that point, we have to go through this period where we are going to see a lot of different technologies being used together to solve this problem. Mm. Frank Topham, what's the future looking like for you? Uh, are your days numbered with Caltex in terms of oil, peak oil? Well, I don't think so, uh, Jenny. Our task is to supply what our customers want. Uh, and at the moment, we sell petrol, we sell diesel, LPG, uh, ethanol uh, blended with petrol, biodiesel blended with petrol. And in the future, uh, I can see that we'll be selling uh, other alternative fuels. So as the vehicles change and as our customers' preferences change, uh, we'll be there to supply it. That's our job. Mm. What about Toyota, Vic? Uh, what technologies do you think are going to be most suitable for Australia? That's a $64,000 question. It's more like the $28 million question. We're spending that much money every day on research and development. What are you spending that R&D money on the at the moment, though? The biggest proportion would be on new driveline technology. What does that mean for a layperson? What's driveline technology? <laughs> Things like better p petrol, better diesel engines, electric motors, batteries, all those kinds of things, and, and in many combinations. So hybrids? Hybrid is, one, is a word that means just more than one power source. Whether that's petrol, diesel, hydrogen, it really doesn't matter. But somewhere in that whole solution is, is more electrification. Mm. Uh, does this reassure you, John, listening to the industry's responses here? No, it's good that they're doing it. And we do need to invest in R&D for uh, new technologies. But we can't gamble on one of those technologies coming uh, into fruition. We do need to be ready for a situation where we simply run out of cheap available liquid fuels. And that means but how do you do that? I mean, uh, uh, if the technology isn't here yet, how do you, how do, you do that? Well, or we, is it here? No, I don't think the technology is here. I think the reality is, is that if we talk about biofuels, CSIRO says we could, if we took all our export wheat and coarse grain and converted that to, uh, to liquid fuels for transport, we would only provide between 10 and 20% of our current transport needs. Not to mention shooting our food prices. And that's the real problem, is it's not sensible to put transport and food production into competition with each other. So biofuels aren't the answer? Current generation biofuels are not the answer. There are some interesting and exciting second and third generation biofuel experiments in the laboratory, but we can't make policy decisions now based on what might or might not emerge from the laboratory over the next 10 to 15 years. So how years. do we make policy the decisions? The only solutions are to start investing very heavily in public transport. We are pointing entirely in the wrong direction. That money should be going into public transport and community transport solutions and into making sure that where we do plan new developments, they're configured in a way that's friendly to public transport. But we've heard this argument again and again. And what I, what I wanted to do tonight, and what I think we've done quite successfully, is show how passionate people are about their cars, how they are, a lot of people are going to want to hang on to their cars, and a lot of people are going to be forced to. I mean, public transport infrastructure can take a long time to get up mm. and running too. What, what is the holy grail in terms of car technology, vehicle technology? Is there a future for the, for the individual vehicle as well as public transport and other things? It's clear that there will always be 
uh, private transport and private vehicles. That's going to happen. We are going to move into a period where unless you're very wealthy, you won't be able to afford for, uh, liquid fuels. You won't be able to afford to operate motor vehicles. It's going to divide on a class basis our society. The only way to protect those people who won't be able to afford to get uh, access to liquid fossil fuels will be to provide some form of community or public transport. Terry, what about... Uh you mentioned Arnold Schwarzenegger's hydrogen Hummer. Um, is that realistic? Is that the future? It certainly is. I mean, there is no silver bullet, only silver buckshot. So when you look at things like electric cars, battery electric cars, or hydrogen, they do offer a lot of promise, and the technology is actually ready. I drive a Honda fuel cell car, as I mentioned earlier, and uh, they're introducing the Clarity, which is the first mass-produced uh, hydrogen uh, vehicle here in California and other parts of the world where there is fueling infrastructure, albeit limited, uh, and they're introducing that in the next few months. They're also introducing, we unveiled at the uh, L.A. Auto Show last November, the Home Fueler where it's about the size of a, of a dishwasher. You attach it to a solar panel or a source of electricity and your garden hose, and uh, you, you break the hydrogen out of water and compress it into your car so you actually don't need fueling infrastructure. And what about, the, what about be... the availability of these things, though? Admittedly, again, we're, we're going to need a transition period where we need all of these other sources of fuel and solutions for the millions of cars that are dependent on a petroleum or a liquid fuel today as we transition to something else. It takes about 18 years in California to turn over the fleet. So if, if tomorrow all of the cars were hydrogen or battery electric uh, and there was sufficient fueling, it would still take about 18 years to get rid of all the old cars and transition into the new ones. Matt, once you decided that you wanted to buy those two hybrid cars. How long did it take you before you could actually get them? Well, we ordered one and it took five months to get it. And what about the other one? How long was oh, that? It would have taken nine. Well, if you wanted a specific colour, it would have taken over six months. Mm. Vic, well, this it's, is your company. Why yeah, are people know, waiting and, uh, that long for I'd these cars? I never met Matt before. I didn't even know he existed. I'm glad he is there because he's got two of them. Two of them. I but he waited a long time to get them, and a lot of people would just get sick of just that. Just a little bit of background. I started selling hybrid cars myself in 2001 when we first launched here. They'd already been in the States uh, just for a short while, but in Japan since 97. And at that time, I could get 20 cars a month out of Japan. That was it. But why is that? Because of the, of the, literally, the supply. Like, we could only build that many. But we had markets like the US taking them up at a huge rate. And at that time, they were selling 1,000 per month in the US. But that's, that... not a, that's not a big. The new model, though, they had enough orders to take up nine months' production. They were selling, at, from launch, 10,000 a month, and I could get 100. Why not make them here? That's a good question. <laughs> it's supply and demand. The biggest problem now, we have supply. We've grown, we grew demand last year 60% to just over 3,000 Prius hybrids. We can get many more than that this year, but we're not getting the extra demand. The demand is plateauing. And to make a business case to a global manufacturer, you've got to, they've got to say, well, where is the demand? And how much is the hybrid costing? Currently, a, a Prius base model is about 37000 and a high grade is 46000 The interesting thing, though, for private buyers is they buy the $46,000 one. It's not the price. It's the car that they want. Mm, that's interesting. But uh, Richard, y yep. your company doesn't even make hybrid.